Hello, hello. These are flipped notes 1.4 for AP Psychology, and we are digging into research methods. So this is a super important part of Unit 1, really the rest of Unit 1, because College Board has told us that there will for sure be a free response question on the AP exam um, about research methods. So research methodology is a huge part of the AP Psych course curriculum. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to look at the different types of research, their purpose, their strengths, their limitations. Uh, not getting much into experiments yet today, but all the others. Um, so there are three main types of research. We've got descriptive or observational, where we're really just observing and describing behaviors, looking for patterns. Correlation, we're finding the relationship between two specific variables. And then experimental research, where we're actually trying to control, manipulate variables, and to determine causation. Today, we're focusing on observational. Um, in psychology, we do use a scientific method. I'm not going to go in depth in this because I'm pretty sure every science class you've ever had, you have gone in depth. Um, but same steps with asking a question, may forming a hypothesis, experiment, observe and record, draw a conclusion, and sharing your findings. Um, so the scientific approach um, does believe that events, including behaviors, um, are governed by some lawful order. Um, our goals are to measure, describe, understand, predict, and then ultimately to try to apply and control. So, you know, to figure out if we're trying to determine what causes anxiety, how do we measure anxiety, how would we describe anxiety, understand and predict when anxiety happens, and then ultimately, can we learn to control anxiety? Um, when forming theories, um, we start with an actual um, idea, uh, we form a hypothesis, we have to conduct empirical research. Uh, when that research is good, it builds confidence in our theories. If it doesn't, the confidence decreases. We either discard the theory or we revise it and we start all over again. Some different ways that we collect data um, in psychology, I'm not going to read everything here, but through direct observations where we are actually observing and watching people or animals. Um, they might use some kind of instrumentation, a stopwatch, but really just like observing behaviors through a questionnaire or a survey, um, through direct interviews, through a psychological test, maybe an intelligence test, a personality test, um, through physiological recording. So that might mean measuring heart rate, blood pressure, brain waves, um, and then looking at archival records, which basically means any other kind of data that somebody else has already connected collected, such as census info, um, grades, educational records, medical records, anything else that's already out there. Once a person does conduct research and they have findings, it's important for them to share them into scientific journals um, so that others can benefit from that research. Uh, let's see, the advantages of the scientific method are that they create clarity of communication and hopefully it's more resistant to errors. Uh, an important part of the sharing of scientific articles is the peer review process. The idea that before you really publish something, like let's say I have conducted a study, I have found a new medication that is going to treat anxiety and it's going to be the cure to all of anxiety. Um, but before I publish my results, I need to ask other professionals in my field to evaluate my study that my research seems sound and reliable, that my conclusions are valid. Um, so it's to ensure that there is going to be reliable findings. Now, if my study involved actually conducting an experiment, uh, which if it was about a medication, that would require a what we call a double-blind experiment, more about that later, um, but I would need other people to repeat my experiment or replicate it to make sure that they get the same results, that maybe this one time I did the experiment, it cured two people with anxiety. Well, can other people replicate my experiment and have the same findings? Um, that's a really important part of the peer review process, but today in research, um, a lot of people who conduct research are finding that they have a problem 
um, getting enough experiments to be replicated. And that's because of the way people acquire research funding, um, that you want to be the first one to make a big discovery. Um, and you're not going to be the one who gets all the attention, and attention equals more funding um, for being the fourth person to replicate a study, unless you replicate it and you find out that it was wrong, and then maybe you can publish something about that. Um, but experiment replication, an important part of the process that that's kind of being struggled with lately. All right, so getting into the actual types of research. Um, so again, these are descriptive or correlational methods that we're looking at today, um, and they're really just looking for relationships. So the key thing here is that with all of these methods, the researcher cannot manipulate the variables. They can't control what is happening in the study. They can only observe the results. So we cannot determine causation here. So for example, we can't determine that something like this you know, chemical in the brain causes anxiety. This is not an experiment. Instead, we can observe behaviors uh, and make connections about patterns and then theorize about different ways to do things that could change their behaviors. Um, the first of these is naturalistic observation. Uh, and it's pretty much what it sounds like, observing things, people or humans, in their natural setting. Um, the key thing here is that the animals or people, whatever the subject is, cannot know they're being observed. Um, so the most common example of this, and I'll come back to that. Pause. Naturalistic observations, um, they're valuable um, whereas other methods can be more disruptive. So the problem is that if people know that they're being observed, they tend to act differently. Um, they're going to be on their best behavior. They're going to do their job the very best they could, different than they normally would. Um, but the other problem is that ethically, you're supposed to tell people if you're observing them. If somebody is in a study, they're supposed to know. So how do you tell them they're in a study without them knowing um, that you're observing them? So it's a little bit difficult. Um, the observations can be distorted if observers expect to see certain behaviors. If, for example, if I'm looking for a certain behavior, like I'm looking for how many times you smiled, and I'm like, oh, I think that was a smile, but maybe it wasn't really. Um, that kind of can affect the results. Um, so we might have to really accurately define what would be a smile, what's considered a smile. Uh, the most famous or classic example for naturalistic observations, they always like to put in textbooks, uh, is Jane Goodall. Uh, and we're going to watch a clip about her in class. Uh, but Jane Goodall studied chimps in the wild. Um, she actually wasn't a scientist. She was more, um, she worked for National Geographic magazine. Um, so that was one reason people scrutinized her, that she wasn't actually a scientist. But she actually like got out into the jungles of Africa and observed chimps. Um, and she noticed things about the way they behave, that they can use tools, um, about when they were aggressive or nurturing to each other. And she did this pretty much her whole life. She's still around. She's, um, she's up there uh, in age, but she's still a huge advocate for preserving habitats um, for animals. But the reason it's a problem, though, that she's considered a naturalist um, or that she's classic example for naturalistic observation is that frequently the chimps knew she was there. Over time, they got used to her and they didn't care. In fact, they loved her. Um, but in a true naturalistic observation setting, the people are not supposed to know that they are being observed. All right, our next type is a case study. This is where we are gathering a large amount of information about a specific subject. So an intense examination um, of behavior mental processes. Um, it's difficult, though, to generalize that information across larger populations. So we have the example in class um, with Jim Fallon, who studied serial killers. So he gathered a lot of information. He studied their educational records, their prison records, um, any kind of like foster records, um, any kind of information about them, and was able to draw conclusions about patterns in their behavior and that they had common childhood histories and that that was probably a contributing factor to their, their criminal behaviors and their mental, um, the way their brain processed relationships. Um, 
but that information can't be generalized to the whole population. It's really only specific to that group of people. Sigmund Freud used case studies. He studied the people that he studied himself, for one. He was his own biggest case study, but he also studied a few people that he was treating, uh, and then he generalized their behaviors to everybody. So sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's useful, though, when something is new. So, for example, when there's like a rare disease um, that nobody really knows a whole lot about. So you want to try to find a few people or as many people as you can who have that rare disease and gather as much info about it. But that info is not going to necessarily apply to everybody. It's just going to apply to everybody else who has that same problem. So some limitations that may contain evidence uh, that a certain researcher thought to be important, but maybe it wasn't really important. Um, it's unlikely to be representative of people in general, but we still get information um, about these individuals, and that might help us to figure something else out later on. Um, so it provides viable information for further research, and it can serve as testing ground for new treatments, training programs, and other applications of research. Our next method are surveys. Um, a survey gathers self-reported attitudes, opinions, behaviors, by questioning people, generally a representative or random sample of people. And we'll go more into detail about representative and random samples. Um, they, let's see, allow researchers to describe patterns of behavior, look for links, but again, we can't imply causation um, just from a survey. The best thing about a survey is that you can provide, you can gather data from a large number of people. It could be, you know, everybody at Red Oak High School. It could be everybody in the United States. Uh, with the census. So you can gather a large amount of data fairly easily. Um, it can be used as part of an operational definition within an experiment, which we'll, we'll talk about those in the next part. Um, so for example, if we're doing an experiment on the impact of wearing rainbow colored socks on happiness, how would you measure happiness? You could give them a survey. Um, the survey in the picture down here comes from the census. Um, but the problem with a survey is that they can be vulnerable to different types of bias. So for example, in a social desirability bias, this has to do with how people answer the questions that maybe people don't answer honest, honestly, they wanna answer in a way that makes them sound like a better person. So if it's a question about drugs, have you ever done drugs? And they think their teacher is going to read the survey. Are they gonna be honest on that survey? What about a survey that asks, how much money do you give to charity every year? Oh, I give a ton of money to charity. People aren't main, you know, especially if it's not sure that it's anonymous, they may not be honest that they don't give much um, to others. Uh, there could be a sampling bias in that maybe they only survey a certain group of people. If I wanted to survey students of Red Oak High School and find out what percentage of students from Red Oak High School plan to go on to a four-year university, and I um, only give that survey to students in my AP psychology classes. That could be skewed. That would be a sampling bias because that is not representative of all the students at Red Oak High School. I would think that quite a few students in an AP class want to go on to a four-year college. But what about students in regular classes who may plan to go to a trade school or the military or they just don't want to go to college at all? Um, another bias is a response set. Uh, this is when people tend to just answer the same way to every question. So this goes with questions where they might say, do you agree, disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree. Uh, maybe you're in a hurry, so you just put agree, 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 agree on everything. Um, so that's not going to help us get valid um, results. Um, so more problems with survey, the, val the validity depends on how well the question was worded. What if the question was confusing? Um, and again, that representativeness of the people who are surveyed. Um, other problems, willingness of people to, honest, complete, to honestly complete the survey. Uh, and people may say what they believe they're supposed to say, what they want people to hear, but it might not be accurate. So doing a, a great survey, um, you can get a lot of data, but a lot of effort needs to be put into making a good survey. Um, so again, the biggest benefit, still a great way to gather large amounts of information. Um, our next type, or specifically our last type for now, um, is a quasi-experiment. Um, so quasi means kind of, but not really. 
um, studies that have the same control as experiments, yet they don't include the random assignment. So we'll talk about that in an experiment, you really want to try to pick people randomly um, to kind of eliminate bias and other problems. Um, so for example, but the, in this, but in a quasi experiment, they're not able to do that. Like there's, for some reason, they just can't randomly pick people. Uh, for example, researchers want to test hypothesis that a pregnant woman's use of drugs will cause abnormalities in her developing baby. So in this experiment, the one group would need to have drugs and the other group would need to not have drugs. Um, so could you ethically randomly assign women who are eight weeks pregnant to a group that will be ingesting narcotic drugs three times a day? No, you can't do that. So this would not be like an experiment that they could really do. So they can kind of look at past you know, examples of people who have done drugs and things or been uh, who had to not necessarily even like illegal drugs, but maybe exposed to something. Um, but in a quasi experiment, you can't really truly do the randomness. So um, the conclusions are not as firm as those drawn from a true experiment, uh, but they allow research to be conducted on topics and settings that would otherwise be impossible. So non experimental, um, there's no comparison group. Uh, in a quasi-experimental group, um, it's hard to control for bias. Uh, and then in an experimental group, we're actually going to have it be randomized. And we'll talk about that more in the next section. Um, oh, my gosh, I lied. There's two more. <laughs> Longitudinal studies versus cross-sectional studies. So these generally apply to um, development studies like child development patterns. Um, about how we're going to conduct a long-term study. So a group of, so for example, let's say uh, we want to study how um, children who wear glasses perform academically versus children who don't wear glasses. So we may have a group of participants who are observed at intervals over an extended period of time. So in a longitudinal study, we're going to take the same group of children. We're going to start, so let's say we have 100 kids in our study. We're going to study them when they get their glasses at two years old versus, let's say, 50 kids who have glasses at two years old, and then 50 kids who have no glasses at two years old. And then we're going to check in with those same kids at four years old, six years old, eight years old, maybe all the way until they're 16, uh, and then keep comparing them. So this study takes a long time, a longitudinal study um, over 16 years. The advantage is we can really see how they've changed over time. The disadvantage is it took 16 years to do that study. So that's expensive that you have to keep checking in, um, that the, you still have the same researchers, your researchers could die, your participants may move away, not be available during the study. But there have been some major longitudinal studies. There was a major one, and I don't have it on here, um, about what makes men happy. It was a hundred something year study done by Harvard um, about, and they tracked these people for so long about, um, you know, what kind of trends made them happy. And they looked at people who ended up getting married and those who had kids and those who didn't. And now they have all these stats on, you know, what kind of things tend to contribute to happiness in men. But a longitudinal study is not always feasible. So the alternative is a cross sectional study. In a cross-sectional study, the researchers are comparing differences and similarities of people at different age groups over time. So instead of having 100 kids who are following for 16 years, we've got 20 kids who are two, 20 other kids who are two with, uh, with glasses. Uh, we've got some more kids who are five, some other kids so two groups of kids who are five, two groups of kids who are 10, we might have 12 year olds, or sorry, 15 year olds, 20 year olds. But these are all at the same time. So we're just gonna study these people and compare them. The advantage, and we might even compare them like over a year, and that could still count as cross-sectional, but because it, it didn't take as long. Um, it's less time consuming than the longitudinal method, but there's so many other factors here. Um, that we can't really control. So for example, you know, these kids who are two-year-olds, it's a different group of kids who are studying at five and 10-year-olds. So there could be different factors specific to them that it's influencing our research. Whereas if we're studying the same kids the whole time, we have less variables interfering. So that's longitudinal versus cross-sectional. And that is it for flipped notes 1.4.